Uh, first, I'll just mention um, uh, you've had a nice overview uh, by uh, Dr. Sao about the um, sort of overview of this workshop. I hope you're going to um, learn lots more in the coming um, uh, days. We're, I'm going to be focusing on uh, phylogenetic analysis, though my research area is generally in what I call um, more sustainable infectious disease control. Uh, I'm interested in different approaches, including um, very much uh, genomic epidemiology for better tracking and um, identifying outbreaks, um, identifying ways to mitigate this. Uh, I have been um, involved in genomic epidemiology analyses for uh, bacterial infectious diseases. And also then um, when, um, Cindy Bell of Genome Canada said, hey, maybe we should set up something like what the UK is doing for COVID. Uh, myself, Will uh, Sow and Gary von Domsler uh, basically got together and uh, worked on setting up this uh, Cancogen or Canadian COVID-19 genomics network that involves um, uh, pretty well everyone and uh, you know involved in this workshop. And uh, essentially what happened was, um, we use that to sort of further develop um, some viral-based uh, analyses that will be um, include uh, some that will be talked about. Uh, I do want to emphasize that um, you know uh, I I get involved in doing a lot of other kinds of analyses like um, genomic um, island-based analyses. So if you ever have any questions about some of these other kinds of microbial bioinformatics analyses. Um, don't hesitate to contact me. And I've also been involved in, um, yeah, I run the pseudomonas.com uh, website with uh, Jeff Windsor in my group. Uh, we, for pseudomonas genomics analysis. And uh, I'm also um, leading the um, data integration and database development for the Canadian child study, child cohort study, which is profiling incredible amounts of detailed data for, um, about 3,500 healthy kids um, uh, temporally over, and it is um, if kids right now that are at age 13 or so. These um, that study also includes a lot of microbiome work, which I'm also involved in. So I've got my hands in a lot of things, and I'm very happy to answer questions. My last point I'll make about myself is that I'm um, very keen to join the um, Q and A at the end of the day today. But I'm uh, I've got a dentist appointment that conflicts, so I'm going to be uh, showing up right after that appointment, just for the last little bit. And again, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. But let's move on to this um, this module, which is a fairly uh, sorry this um, uh, Zoom updated, and um, it is now there. We go. Okay. Uh, uh, so basically, um, uh, today what we're going to do is talk about phylogenetic analysis. Uh, uh, oh, I also want to mention, um, uh, you know, my, um, uh, uh, sorry, just one second here. Shoot. Uh, um, well, I'll bring it up at, uh, more at the end. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, I do want to start with um, uh, just... Uh, uh, doing a territorial um, acknowledgement that I'm on the unceded territories of the Swaytooth, Coquitlam, and um, uh, uh, Musqueam uh, nations upon which I reside and, and play. Uh, the um, sorry. So then, uh, I just want to mention uh, I am associated with um, molecular biology, biochemistry, computing science, and faculty of health sciences at SFU. Okay, so uh, today, by the end of this lecture, you'll hopefully understand some fundamentals of character-based evolutionary analysis and phylogenetic analysis. Really what we want to do is, is, Will has given you a bit of an overview, and now we want to get into some details. And the goal here is really just to be able to sort of look at phylogenetic analyses, interpret them, um, know the basics of how to build a phylogenetic tree. Oh, sorry, am I in the wrong mode? Oh dear, just a minute. There we go. You should be able to see now the, um, and I'm going to just uh, put on the chat, sorry. Uh, there we go, I've got the chat. 
Uh, can you not see the um, full screen slides right now? We can, it's fine. It is? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Okay, oh, sorry. Just lost it now. Yeah, I know. Oh my God. Sorry, I was just saying full screen. Yes, chat. yeah, that's fine, Fiona. Okay, sorry about that. Ah, okay, so um, I, uh, I want you to also appreciate how the basics of how you build a phylogenetic tree and key differences during to, between methods. But first, let's just step way back. I want you to appreciate that um, this evolutionary theory, how it evolved, was like many, many theories where you have something comes up, uh, there's some ideas that are circulating. Um, at the time when this theory got um, first made, there was appreciation the world was not constant but changing. Plate tectonics were appreciated. There was discovery of, of, of fall of fossils accumulating. And we were starting to see cool things like the deeper the strata, the more the fossils resembled, say, this coast of Africa and this coast of South America. And we were starting to realize that this was all um, making sense, that there was um, um, this sort of history. And uh, it was still a bit debated whether there's remains of unknown but still living plant uh, species that are elsewhere on the planet. But Cuvier did really have this landmark study showing the deeper the strata, the less similar fossils were to existing species. And that combined with this really set the stage uh, for origin of the species, um, uh, Charles Darwin's landmark analysis, which really was notable because um, it really gave a mechanism. So they, there was already this feeling, as with any theory, that um, an, an appreciation for something that then this was a sort of a mechanism that really made people understand it. And the idea was that all organisms were derived from common ancestors by a period of process called branching. And this explained the fossil record, similarities of organisms classified together in that they shared um, um, uh, traits inherited from common ancestor, and then similar species in a same geographic region. So you would have an ancestral species, and then these sort of um, branching, and there might be an end of a branch reflecting some sort of um, extinct uh, species, and then you'd have these sort of living species as the leaves of the tree at the end. So um, now today, we generally feel that there's this sort of common ancestor, just to give you some, uh, go way back, uh, where thought, Earth is thought to be approximately about 4.6 billion years old, Life is thought to have occurred as far back as about 4.1 billion years based on um, carbon isotope dating and um, also a fossil of microbial mat. Um, all cellular organisms share this um, last universal common ancestor or LUCA that dates back to more than 3.8 billion years where you know what uh, really is notable is there's sort of shared components of genetic code and amino acid uh, chirality, which implies sort of this universal ancestor. And now uh, today, you know, uh, the famous quote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So we really have moved towards a lot of evolutionary based analyses as we sort of appreciate that we should be looking from that LUCA and forward. Okay. And so that moving forward, um, evolution, uh, the, my favorite um, simple definition is descent with modifications. It's basically just changes in heritable characteristics over time that occur in these biological populations over generations. So every time there's a new generation, nature beautifully makes little errors or, or um, mix, uh, you know, mixes up uh, sequences so that you end up with these slight changes and basically there's sort of a natural selection process where the sort of fittest survive and the ones that have some, com uh, some uh, kind of advantage will do better. We see this all the time with SARS-CoV-2 evolution where we've got all these sort of immune evasive variants or variants that can better bind our human ACE2 receptor that will allow us to be able to, uh, maybe it, allow it to be able to infect better. But I want to emphasize there's also neutral evolution. There's these changes occurring, and sometimes those changes don't really make any difference to what's happening with a sequence. But those are still provide nice little clock-like changes, and we can use that, uh, these kind of changes um, in analyses, both the sort of advan advantageous ones. We can sort of 
learn something about function and with neutral ones, we can learn something about distance between uh, samples, for example, in um, microbial genomic epidemiology. So um, these uh, processes give rise, of course, to biodiversity, and there's estimated 8 million living species with uh, 2.3 million uh, named and about 80% uh, calculated in databases. Uh, that is, uh, I want to say, though, um, controversial because, of course, there's many phage and viruses that we really haven't uh, touched on yet and, and um, studied. And generally, it's thought that you've got sort of this bacterial diversity and um, gene pool associated with bacteria, then you've got this sort of archaeal diversity and, and gene pool associated with that and eukaryotic diversity and gene pool. And then these gene pools have these viral gene pools for bacteria or, vir or um, archaea that are basically like a cloud of things that are popping in and out that are generally about 10 times more um, prevalent the sort of, fair, for example, phage diversity over bacterial diversity, roughly. So appreciate that you've got this sort of diversity in this gene pool, say with bacteria, with this viral diversity associated with it, or in eukarya that we also care about um, with the uh, viral diversity associated with that. Okay, so then um, one thing that happens, of course, is we've got asexual reproduction, clonal reproduction, where bacteria do a very good job of making uh, copies of themselves, still with um, built-in bits of error. Uh, but there's also these other evolutionary processes that blur the boundaries, uh, in particular horizontal gene transfer or what we also call lateral gene transfer. And lateral gene transfer it, you know, is primarily sort of infection by phages, but there's also... Um, uh, 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 mechanisms that include um, just uh, the basic uptake of DNA and conjugation that result in uh, movement of chunks of DNA. And those generally, as somebody who studies those a lot, they disproportionately include genes uh, often of medical um, and, um, you know, uh, even environmental adaptive um, significance. Uh, they disproportionately include virulence factors, for example, and pathogens, uh, because they really are these uh, chunks that are coming over that when uh, that usually confer some sort of advantage, because especially if it's something that increases the size of the genome, because uh, that literally has a cost benefit having that extra chunk. And so there'll be more about that later. Uh, what I want to focus on to, uh, my this module is some terminology. And getting you to appreciate the basics of phylogenetics. So I'm gonna go through a number of terms that will be used throughout the workshop. And, um, but one thing we won't talk about too much is systematics, which is a study of the interrelationships of living things, but you'll hear taxonomy mentioned, which is really the science of naming and classifying organisms and evolutionary theory is not necessarily involved. What we're gonna focus on right now is phylogenetics, which is a field of the systematics that focuses on evolutionary relationships, um, either between organisms or genes or proteins. Um, and we talk about looking at the say phylogeny of, of some genes. The, um, just gonna just check if there's anything in the chat, nope. So for phylogenetics, um, this usually involves, uh, particularly for genomic epidemiology, molecular sequence data, of, of course, uh, looking at DNA and proteins. But note that the um, uh, phylogenetics can be based on morphological features. Um, you know, you can do it based on uh, unusual uh, uh, features, for example, that have some sort of um, uh, potential homology or uh, shared ancestry. And so um, we uh, infer these relationships usually using phylogenetic trees. So here's a tree just looking at some relationships among some primate species where, um, you know, uh, you would have these kinds of, um, you know, uh, uh, bifurcating patterns in, uh, and this is one of several assumptions in many phylogenetic methods is that you don't, you can't just have one, um, point branch out to many points that you usually have a bifurcating nature. And uh, the terminology in terms of how we describe the trees is usually you have a root to the tree. There's branches. 
there's nodes, and then there's a terminal nodes, which are called leafs. Um, they can also be called operational taxonomic units. And that term also gets used when we try to cluster sequences together in metagenomics analysis, but we've largely replaced that term um, uh, with amplicon sequence variants in, in many cases, just to sort of make it clear that these aren't necessarily operational taxonomic units. Uh, and they'll, uh, basically it's a, a way of sort of um, uh, coming up with looking at these as groups uh, that have an independent name. Uh, but the key of with these um, sort of leaves, these are usually the, the living species or the, the, the things that you're analyzing. And the internal nodes represent some sort of ancestral species before a divergence event. And the ancestors, again, uh, are the root, but I want, as I'll show you, not all trees have a root. So another term we tend to refer to is clades, and you'll hear that a lot. Uh, that's basically a monophyletic group, as in uh, basically they include um, the recent common ancestor and all the descendants for that recent common ancestor. So this sequence is A and B here are, uh, you know, this is a, a clade. And uh, here in A and B are what we call sister taxa, and they are basically species or clades arising from the same node. Um, here's a second clade here uh, with the C and D or sister taxa. And then um, clade one and clade two, them uh, together are sister taxa. And if you had a further branch here, you know, this could be considered a whole clade, right? So you do, they don't have to just, they can, you can have clades of clades um, per se. But, uh, but basically, um, uh, you know, I want to also go over the concept of, of this kind of way that we show these. Um, there's a number of ways you can visualize these. And I would say this is really important. I find people often misinterpret trees by not appreciating the different ways they can be shown and the ways they can be manipulated that actually don't impact your interpretation of them. So first, um, note that this is a cladogram. Cladograms or cladograms are only show the branching order. The branch lengths don't have any meaning. It's just basically a way to sort of line these guys up of A, B, and C, for example. And here it's just showing that A and B share a common ancestor more recently than either does with C, okay? And that A, B, and C share some sort of uh, common ancestor. Now note, you can show this in different ways. Uh, this tree and this tree are identical in the sense that they're both showing the same thing. They're both showing A and B have a common ancestor more recently than uh, with C. Um, the way this is done sometimes if you have long names, it's just sort of more convenient to, to show it this way. Um, and sometimes this way is preferred because it sort of shows that sort of history or direction of evolution going, you know, up, for example. Um, the um, branching order um, can sometimes look a bit uh, uneven like this. And that's your clue that this is probably a phylogram. So phylograms have scaled branches to indicate some sort of level of similarity, such as number of sequence changes. And so this tree indicates that A has acquired more substitutions than B since the time they shared a common ancestor. And these branch lengths can be indicated by using either a scale bar or a, a number on the bar or both. I would say that now, today, most people do scaled bars and they don't show the numbers there uh, in, in most cases. Uh, so usually the numbers are what we call bootstrap values, which I will bring up that are associated with nodes. And I'll bring that up in a bit, but I just don't want you to confuse this with bootstrap values. And the key message is that when drawn vertically, any distance between two nodes is some of the vertical branches between them. And when drawn horizontally, it's the same thing, but it's any distances between two nodes, some of the horizontal branches. So for example, the distance between A and B is four plus two, right? Which is six. Um, this one is pointing to this branch. You don't care about this branch. These, these branches are just to separate out the uh, different uh, nodes or, or um, uh, leaves on the tree. So um, uh, for example, the distance between B and C, uh, you might wanna take two seconds and think what you think the distance between B and C is. 
And, um, and basically what you would do is you would look at this one, this one and this two. And so the distance between B and C is four, right? Okay. And so um, the idea is this uh, basically allows you to look at relationships um, and a little bit more, um, uh, get a real sense of the scale of degree of similarity. So uh, these trees, again, can be oriented in different ways. You can have horizontally or vertically. This is just examples of horizontal, vertical cladograms or phylograms. Um, and then I also, I think one of the more important things that I find people who aren't familiar with biogenetic analysis don't appreciate is that you can rotate these branches. Think of it like a, you know, a little sort of rotating um, uh, 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 device, statue or something, I, got it, I forgot the word, but anyways, um, you're rotating these. So you can rotate this, for example, this tree is equivalent to this tree. All we've done is just rotated A, B, C, and D as A, B, C, and D, right? Okay, and then you could rotate here. And so it's A, you know, this, instead of B, C, and D here, it's B, C, and D here. So you can rotate these in many ways. So just appreciate that just because this guy is, uh, or sort of this one in cl is close to this one here, that is not the sign that these are closely related. You have to look at the branches. So you have to look at the length of this branch, this branch, this branch, and this branch to get the sense of DNA. Whereas C and D are clearly uh, much more related because they just have this branch and this branch that connects the two, okay? So um, the root of trees can be very useful as a sort of anchor for looking at your tree. It's the ancestor of all sequences in your tree. And a tree with a root is really useful because it shows the order of descent or the sort of direction of evolution. Your root is sort of like considered the older and then you've got um, all the way to the newer. And uh, an unrooted tree basically lacks a root and doesn't show the direction of evolution. And so it's less informative. It's often draw, drawn in what we call radial format, where it's just they're sort of sticking out in different directions, um, sort of like a, a snowflake in many cases. And the un, unrooted tree is still valuable for giving you a sense of, of how related some things are, but they can't tell you, for example, you know, um, where the start of this evolutionary tree is. It could be here, it could be here could be here and then these two branched off and these guys all branched off. It could be here and these two are sort of more um, closely related to the root. It could be here and these guys branched off and these guys branched off. It could be even here, you know? So um, so what we tend to like to do is, um, is look at a rooted tree. Um, here's an unrooted tree uh, where we just don't know you know where the ancestor is. Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? Um, here, <clears throat> uh, we if we have a root, we can say that this start started here, and then species four branched off, then species one, then species two, and species three, and we have got a sense of what are the ancestral points of the, any, along that tree, and that can be very valuable. So uh, to root a tree, um, we need we often use an outgroup basically a sequence that is thought to be ancestral or more distantly related to all the members of your tree than to others. So for example, if you want, had a mammalian tree and you wanted to root it, you might root it with a non-mammalian vertebrate, for example, as an outgroup. So you wanna root this tree and see what the relationship is. You might wanna root it with a uh, zebrafish, for example. And, um, and that allows you either in either of these trees that says this, this um, you know, di this uh, cow diverged and then chimp and human are have a shared ancestor versus cow, okay? Um, so uh, take a second and you've got the answer in your slides, but try to not look at it and say, you know, tell yourself for a second based on what you've learned so far, you know, what does this tree tell you? And I'll just give you a second to look at this and see, you know, what kinds of things does this tree tell you? And feel free, you know, even if you have any questions to, to put them in the chat and I'll, I'll look out, though I'll also check in at the end.
Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you right now, the first thing that strikes me when I look at this tree is I see these differing branch lengths. That tells me without even looking at the method that it's a phylogram. And uh, so these branch lengths are probably meaningful. And sure enough, you can look at your method and figure out if that's true. But um, it also appears to be rooted because there's a line here. But I really want to emphasize here that many people will, and particularly in the old days, would make trees with a method that would show a fake root that would just be like the midpoint of an analysis and it would actually not necessarily be the root. So you've got to confirm that you've actually got a root here. If it was, see if it says it was rooted with something or if you can see some sort of ancestral species, say there's um, another line here showing something like, um, you know, uh, something that's not mammalian, for example, that might would give you more, you would say, okay, that's sort of a root. Um, this also uh, tells you that the mouse lineage has undergone some sort of accelerated evolution. Now this was uh, exaggerated, but the main point is that, um, uh, you know, this is sort of showing this accelerated evolution, which is true. And actually, um, fun fact, uh, because mice have undergone an accelerated evolution versus humans, if you actually look at the average similarity between human and cow or bovine uh, genes, and you look at a normal distribution of that, the um, human and bovine are actually more sequence similar than human and mice because of their accelerated evolution and um, sure enough, in this tree, A, B, and C is shorter than um, a, uh, a and D, right? So that's the distance between human and bovine. And that's the um, uh, distance uh, here is A and D. So uh, basically, um, uh, what I want you to appreciate is that leads to challenges because when you do a tree, it can actually mistakenly think a human and bovine because they share more sequence similarity that they're actually ancestral. So, uh, you know, you have to be very careful with um, looking out for things where there is a um, accelerated evolution occurring in a lineage. It can cause um, some challenges. And I'd be happy to talk about that more as needed. Okay, so um, let's move forward with how we build a tree. How are we for time? Okay, we're good. So, um, so first, uh, we take a sequence, obviously, and we're going to end up with a tree. So first things first, I can't emphasize enough is you're doing a multiple sequence alignment, okay? You don't just make a tree from your sequences. You have to make an alignment. And this alignment is really important because what you're doing is if you're, say, taking um, a sequence, you're going from, say, information to bioinformatics over time, you know, you're trying to line things up and you're basically implying that, say, from information to bioinformatics in this alignment, that, uh, you know, this is just showing over time that there was, you know, this insertion of an O and this change to um, an S uh, uh, to an N or a C here and this, this BI added on uh, kind of thing. When you show an, a multiple sequence alignment, they're all jumbled up. The, there are no, there's no sort of nice order per se of the sequences in terms of their uh, evolutionary history. And these all represent existing sequences. So you'd be like maybe looking at bioinformatics and information and aligning those two and not seeing all these intermediates. Uh, so this sequence alignment is really basically taking um, uh, homologous uh, or shared ancestry positions of homologous sequences into the same column. So it's assuming that these sequences have some sort of shared ancestry. And it's assuming that uh, this column here is all lined up such that this particular uh, residue has some sort of shared ancestry. And just over time, there's been changes uh, such that, for example, in this case, you could see there's this um, uh, uh, tryptophan that is basically, you know, a W or twiptophan is my favorite Elmer Fudd way of remembering uh, that am amino acid. Um, and, uh, but you can see here that there's some sequences that have, uh, you know, uh, evolved uh, quite a bit here with some change where there's um, some sequences that share some valines here, uh, for example, but there's different residues in these places. The main message I want to make is that um, 
care about your multiple sequence alignment because it is basically lining up all your data and treating each of these, these items as characters versus looking at different components of a skull. And it's, it's doing an analysis of these different characters. Then another important component is your model of evolution. So you're basically um, have some sort of model of saying what kind of change you think is occurring. And that helps you infer the significance of these changes, right? And lastly, you've got this tree building algorithm that basically is trying to usually sort of um, look at different uh, possibilities for trees or clustering sequences and making uh, trees based on sort of more of a, a cluster based analysis. Okay, so uh, four steps incur then. So again, as I've emphasized, you're constructing a multiple sequence alignment. And I wanna emphasize that this has to be um, good quality sequences, ideally labeled with relevant contextual data. And after this, you're gonna hear uh, a great lecture about um, contextual data from Emma Griffiths. Uh, uh, and then um, we also determine um, evolution or a substitution model to use, uh, build the tree and then evaluate the tree. And um, you know, again, uh, sequence quality issues are also gonna get brought up as well as contextual data more in future modules. Okay, so there's really two main methods I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna go through them pretty briefly. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. There's detail on the slides for reference and certainly I encourage you to read up more on them if you want. What I want to focus more on is some of this kinds of interpretation uh, versus um, some of the methods. But appreciate that there's two main types, distance-based and character-based methods. Distance-based methods take the sequences and take all those columns of characters and so come up with pairwise distances between the sequences. And character-based analyses, and this, this is nice and fast, actually, because you're converting it into this sort of distance matrix. Uh, Character-based methods is usually align sequences directly during tree building and tend to be a little bit more robust um, uh, because of that. So distance-based methods basically get a, make a distance matrix using a multiple sequence alignment. It's um, uh, basically you can count, for example, the number of sites at which they differ. There's common methods include the unweighted pair group method with our arithmetic mean or UPGMA, which we're not going to go into for time, and neighbor joining, um, which I'll briefly bring up. And the idea is uh, um, basically, oh, sorry, just a minute. I need to hide one thing here. So, um, so basically, so, so say, uh, basically you're inputting as an N by N matrix M, where basically you have these distances between these sequences, I and J, and the goal is to build a tree where each leaf corresponds to a sequence in M, where the distance is measured between the leaves I and J, uh, which is DIJ, correspond to MIJ. Now, um, I'm going to cut to the chase without getting into this a lot to say that the tree that exactly fits this matrix often doesn't exist. So we have to try to find the closely mapped, most closely matched um, matrix. And so Basically, you can take a tree and sort of get a, the distances, but to go from distances to a tree, that turns out to be, um, uh, you know, not a challenge. And uh, even finding the best fit tree turns out to be an NP complete problem, which means it's computationally uh, takes very, very long. And so we need heuristic or approximate approaches, as is used in many areas of, of um, bioinformatics. And uh, in this case, what we do is there's a heuristic method called neighbor joining, which basically joins at each step the uh, two closest subtrees that are not already joined, okay? And this uh, approach is, starts out with a distance matrix um, and a completely unresolved tree, like a, what we call a star phylogeny. And then a matrix is calculated from the original distance matrix to determine the average distance from each node to all the other nodes, okay? And based on these distances between the new node and, um, uh, sorry, uh, so then it basically takes these two and says, okay, these two are the most uh, similar together, okay? And so it basically uh, puts those two together, right? And then the distances between this new node 
um, and the two sequences A and B, the nodes are, are reconnected. So I guess I already mentioned that. And that's referred to as star decomposition. So basically what you're doing is saying, okay, these two are most similar. I'm gonna put those together. And then I've got this sort of N minus one situation. And I'm gonna say, okay, which are the most similar here next? Maybe F and E are most similar next. And I'm gonna join those two next, or maybe, uh, this U1 and C is the most similar next, and I'm going to put um, C off of here, okay? The result is you end up with an unrooted tree with branch lengths, which is very valuable. And so you can see here that it's A and B, and then C, and then F, and then um, D and E is, is a result here. This tree can be uh, rooted if one of the sequences is known to be an outgroup. So say F turns out to be an outgroup. Um, you could use that to root the tree and imply this history. Note that it won't necessarily find the optimal tree. And um, one thing I haven't mentioned in the slides here I'm realizing is the input order of sequences even can make a difference. Um, so you do wanna be careful to realize that this is a heuristic method. However, a lot of testing is shown this really works well and it's fast. So if you want a fast sense of what's going on, this is a great uh, method to use. But you do have to watch out. So one of the things is that distance matrices throw, throw information away. Many distinct data sets can yield the same uh, measures. Uh, you can also have gaps that are, are basically um, can really muck up your analysis. So say you have some sequences where you have a really low quality sequence and it's just got a you know, part of the, the sequence of interest. You're missing a whole bunch of the sequence. Well, gaps are not incorporated into distance matrices. It's only looking at sequences where you've got a character. So if you look at this, uh, you know, I invite you to check out, if you know that gaps are not incorporated, what component of this sequence would be used by a distance matrix method? Okay, you obviously, you wanna have, make sure there's a character in all of these columns. Well, the answer is just this part or like half of this sequence is being incorporated. Okay, so if you've got uh, for certain methods, you do have to watch out. And in contrast, though, character based methods basically look directly at the sequences. They care. They, they look at gaps and generally regarded as giving more accurate trees. So you'll see that most people are using those um, extensively. So character-based method, also called discrete methods, operate on the sequences. There's two major methods I'm going to mention, maximum parsimony and maximum likelihood. Um, maximum parsimony involves, and I'll, I'll briefly bring up some other methods too, um, and also we'll have a bit more in subsequent lecture uh, le uh, modules. But um, maximum parsimony basically involves uh, finding the tree that describes the sequences using the fewest evolutionary steps. It says, Let's just find what are the minimum number of changes we can make to uh, it, um, infer this tree, okay? Maximum likelihood involves finding the tree that most likely has produced the data given some sort of model of evolution. So it basically sort of turns everything inside out and says, okay, we're gonna look at um, this model of evolution and we're gonna make a tree and we're gonna see if that tree uh, reflects the data. And then we're gonna try and make another tree um, that's uh, another version of a tree. And we're going to try all these different trees and see which one it makes. So maximum likelihood, again, uh, tries to find the tree, um, again, um, using the multiple sequence alignment, okay? Requires this model of sequence evolution, a tree, and the observed data. How, in other words, given data D and a model M, find the tree such that this is maximized, okay? Now this uh, model can be important. Uh, often a common model used is just, uh, you know, for example, looking at transitions and transversions. Um, so transitions are basically an exchange of purines or ag, as I, and I think of pyrimidines as cut because there's a uracil as well. And transversions are basically the interchange of a, um, uh, sorry, there's pyrimidines uh, transversions are basically an interchange of purine or pyrimidine. It's a much more significant change in the sequence. And this should be reviewed to many of you, but basically they're not favored. So transitions tend to occur at higher frequency without impacting sequence. And um, 
and also uh, uh, whereas transversions, there's a lot of possibilities, but because these are so easy to count, occur, these tend to occur more frequently. Now, um, consider this, for example, uh, uh, following four sequences and the tree, uh, basically one, two, three, four, right? Where one and two are grouped and three or four are grouped shown by these brackets. And what we're looking at is what is the probability of D1, i.e. position one, given this tree and the model of evolution that says the transition is 0.3, um, and uh, transversion is 0.1 and a P of uh, no change is uh, 0.6. Basically what we do is we can calculate the probability of this tree for every possible reconstruction of the ancestral sites X and Y. And this is what I wanna emphasize is other words, um, we're, we're trying to look at all the possibilities. Here there's 16 values to calculate, okay? Um, and uh, essentially, this is what makes it time consuming for this method, because it's trying to look at every possible reconstruction. And basically, then, um, with these 16 values calculated, essentially, we can determine the probability of the column given the tree and model. And so we're sort of saying, okay, there's all these possibilities. What is the um, probability of this particular um, scenario? And then other positions are calculated in a similar manner. And once we have these, we basically put them all together and then get the likelihood of one particular tree, okay? But we need to look at all three to find the one that gives the largest value, right? So we're looking at this one, this one, and this one. These are three possibilities, right? Where one and two and three and four are this way, or one and two and three and four are this way, or one and four and two and three are this way, okay? In short, and I know I've gone through that really quickly, but I want to get to the, the, the crunch of what you should care about the most is that this requires searching through many possible trees, very computationally intensive. And, but it can also, the evolutionary model can include other things like time. So this uh, means uh, considering each topology and best branch lengths for each topology. And so the result though is uh, nice because it's, um, it's uh, looking at all these possibilities and gives you an actual probability of that tree. But I do wanna emphasize that it's dependent on the model of evolution used. So you really sort of have to appreciate the model of what kind of changes you're um, looking at. Okay, there are other approaches. There's uh, Bayesian approaches, which we'll also get alluded to. Uh, this applies Bayes theorem to estimate probability distribution for a population of interest and basically has the ability to incorporate prior information for events, like a prior distribution for outbreak onset time. Um, so there'll be more about that. Uh, but um, uh, another thing I want to highlight is recombination appro aware approaches. So recombination invalidates most approaches since the columns of your multiple sequence alignment, again, have to be homologous. homologous. So it's important as part of your analysis to detect possible recombination before performing a phylogenetic analysis. And then ideally you're only performing phylogenetic analysis on these subset of sequences that you know are homologous that don't have recombination. Now there are some approaches for how to deal with that. Uh, that's a bit beyond the scope of this uh, short um, uh, module. Uh, you know, you can take a whole four year degree in molecular evolution analysis. But, um, but uh, I also want to emphasize that uh, there's different kinds of methods that have been developed that are quite novel. Um, Usher, for example, enables very rapid SARS-CoV-2 analysis, basic, basically placing a sample on a very large tree versus um, so not sort of having to do the whole a tree construction and allows very rapid based analyses. So we're gonna cover more like Bayesian approaches and time trees in the phylogynamics course module, which is awesome. This is where you really get into the meat of some of the things that can be done and what is possible with um, uh, genomic epidemiology analysis. Okay, so what is the best build tree building approach? Um, I get asked that. Obviously there's no single method really is best for all circumstances. It depends on the size and complexity of the data set speed of your computing resources, why you want to perform the analysis. For example, you know, if you're wanting to just quickly 
find out where a SARS-CoV-2 sequence is, uh, should be placed in a tree, um, you know, something like Usher is a very good uh, approach. If you've got a very small number of sequences uh, where you really care about the uh, getting a very accurate approach, doing a um, um, maximum likelihood approach, Bayesian approach with maximum likelihood approach with some different models, um, <clears throat> you know, you can try a few and see if you start to sort of get some consensus. Um, when it comes to identifying the best model, you can also try a few and how well, see how well they fit the data. There's J model test as an example of a, an approach that looks at different evolutionary models of sub nucleotide substitution. But key message is there's no single best method. Often you're trying to do the best method you can with the based on the size of tree you have and the speed of your computing resources. Okay. Um, uh, I also want to talk about uh, tree evaluation in the last bit of this. Uh, bootstrapping is a very popular uh, approach for testing if the whole data set is supporting the tree or if that tree is, you know, just that you're actually getting as a result is just a slight winner among e equally, um, nearly equal alternatives. So you really want to sort of know how much is this reflecting really the true tree. So what you do is you generate new data sets, usually 100 or 1,000, that are slightly perturbed from the original data set. Um, an example is to take um, some columns and duplicate them and replace uh, some columns, and some are removed. And you're taking these columns of the multiple sequence alignment and ran, um, doing little pertub perturbations to say, OK, well, if we added this column twice and we or we removed this column, what happens to the tree? Does it still give the same branching order? And uh, so each replicate tree is based using the same method as the original tree. You're just doing it the same way with these slightly perturbed data sets. So these slightly perturbed data sets, run it as you've been running it. You do it, say, 100 times, and you see how many times out of 100 you get the tree, the same uh, tree uh, branching order. And particularly, you label the tree at the nodes with numbers indicating how often that cluster occurs in the trees made from the replicates. Or a consensus tree is built and labeled. So you can either take your original tree and label it with these um, nodes. In this case, um, this tree is trying to show one means 100%. And 0 0.51 is, uh, yeah, thank you, is uh, like 51%. And you're basically taking, um, uh, this tree and saying, okay, uh, this is how often this node occurs. So this is trying to say that this branch here, um, you know, is occurring. These two are, uh, I'm just trying to move some, this virus three and virus four, 100% of the time they were grouping together, okay? But this one here is saying only 51% of the time these two are grouping together. And uh, sorry, I should, I should finish what I was saying earlier that you can either overlay these values on your original tree with branch lengths, or you can take a consensus tree. But I wanna emphasize these bootstrap values are just on the branching order, not to do with branch length, okay? Just branching order. And it's basically saying 51% of the time virus six and virus seven joined to, uh, uh, were together. And that's sort of a warning for you that maybe they really aren't, don't have a shared ancestral relationship. It might be that in other versions of the trees, you had virus six was branching off, you know, say over here, and virus seven was just its own thing, or vice versa, or maybe virus, uh, you know, um, uh, six and seven, you know, had some other different uh, virus six or virus seven had some other different kind of placement. Okay, so um, <clears throat> often you can get a bit of a hint by the lengths here. Often this is sort of saying that this group this and this, like virus six, virus seven, and this whole clade, including virus one to virus five, you're sort of branched off at about the same time and it's hard to resolve what's going on there. But, um, <clears throat> but you know, it, uh, sometimes, um, you know, the, the main point is that you wanna get this sense of, you know, what are the reliable branches, okay? Like this guy is branching off 100% of the time, this is branching off 100% of the time, this virus eight. And um, uh, bootstrap generally of over 70% is a good given good support for the cluster. 
Okay, so also useful is identifying unique characters versus homoplasy. Um, so for example, uh, in animals, uh, we have you know, a series of characters that have occurred once in evolution, evolution or unreversed. So for example, fur in mammals. So if you go into the middle of the Amazon and you see an animal you've never seen before and it has fur, you instantly can say that is very likely a mammal. So it's very useful for inferring relationships. Similar with sequences, you know, if you see a certain character <clears throat> that is very um, associated with a particular um, clade of bacteria or a particular clade of, of SARS-CoV-2, you can sort of imply that, okay, that's probably most likely part of that clade because it's sort of this very unique identifiable character. And so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, if you find an indel, for example, only in sequences associated with an outbreak in a certain geographic location, a phylogeny suggests a new sequence of interests that may have evolved elsewhere from, um, from another, uh, you know, there's a new sequence elsewhere that may have originated from that location. It's nice if you can see, you know, if that uh, contains that unique indel, that would further support your phylogeny saying, okay, yeah, that sequence that's from, you know, Ontario maybe is really related to that BC outbreak uh, because it's got that uh, additional sort of unique character. So just remember that in addition to some of the analyses you'll see. Um, also useful is identifying convergent evolution. Um, you have, uh, for example, the great convergence of SARS-CoV-2 variant, viral variants, where we, you'll be familiar with these names, maybe like BA5 or BQ1 or whatever. This is an older picture, but the main point is that all these variants, as they evolved, they, they all sort of started to gain independently the same immunovasive mutations because they're so advantageous for it. And those can be useful. You can look at that and see, um, find evidence that if something keeps showing up, it keeps on evolving, and then there's selection for that, that implies that maybe there's something useful for that and you can functionally study that further. Okay, also useful is identifying orthologs, paralogs, and xenologs, and I understand that's been mentioned already a bit. Uh, apologies, I wasn't able to see that part. But uh, so just briefly, orthologs tend to have similar functions, so they tend to be of interest. Uh, you know, you've got a duplication, speciation uh, here, for example, but if this is just uh, diverging due to speciation, this H sequence and M sequence are considered orthologs. Paralogs, where you've had a duplication, it doesn't make sense to have two copies of something doing the same thing. So usually they have some sort of divergence in function. So you do want to look out for paralogs because they can have some sort of differing function at some level. It might be a duplication of a transporter in a bacteria where one um, takes up arginine and one takes up um, um, uh, you know, another amino acid. Um, uh, or, you know, and maybe they both take, take up uh, positively charged amino acids, for example. Um, uh, so there's a functional maybe change at some level. Um, also, xenologs are of interest because they tend to uh, impart novel adaptive functionality to the recipient organism. And uh, I want to emphasize that here, when you're orthologs, you're trying to find the gene tree matches the species tree, okay? So you've really got to look at that or you can do a uh, reciprocal best blast tin analysis. Um, the, with paralogs, there's multiple copies in the same species. With xenologs, the gene uh, doesn't match the species tree when the rest of the tree does match. Uh, very briefly, because I'm sort of running out of time, is there's in paralogs where you have a um, species divergence um, that occurs um, uh, before. So this is like an in paralogs here where you've got um, a species divergence and then two copies of a gene that is duplicated in one species. And then you've got out paralogs, which is the vast majority of these big transporter families are all sort of out paralogs of, of duplications that occurred um, uh, before, uh, you know, uh, species, um, uh, uh, before species divergence. And you've got many, many kinds like that. And so this is very useful um, one thing that's notable is that, for example, you can infer that this 
species M and species H2 genes are likely uh, more likely functionally similar. With this H1 and H3, it's less clear um, what's going on, you know, has one or the other diverged in function versus what M1 is like, because there's this paralogous relationship, okay? Um, there's lots of different kinds of examples, duplications of, of genes in bacteria that will occur as in paralogs um, that I give as an example. Okay, closing comments in my last minute. Uh, phylogenetic analysis basically allows us to estimate or infer evolutionary relationships between genes or proteins. I'd really like to em emphasize that we talk about inference because we are never saying for sure what's going on. We have seen evolution in action. We certainly have seen it with SARS-CoV-2. We've seen it with, um, read about the Manchester moths and how they changed to be darker colored when uh, we had the industrial revolution in the UK and the sooty environment. Um, gave them an advantage if they were darker colored in the soot. Uh, I'd also like to emphasize that, uh, but so so that kind of, um, it, we have seen evolution in, uh, but we're always inferring what's happening, okay? Uh, the second thing I'd like to emphasize is data quality is paramount. And we're gonna talk more about that later. Um, we have covered some basic methods uh, but uh, I do want to emphasize that uh, more complicated and efficient methods are needed to deal with genomic level size data. And so we'll look at some of these uh, techniques and approaches in the rest of the workshop. Um, and note that it's well best interpreted if you have well incorporated uh, contextual data, geography data, patient information, so more about that.